In this video I'm going to show you a concept for constructed languages I've been working on for a while now. I haven't seen something like this in the context of constructed languages, so I wanted to share my ideas with a broader audience. I've been interested in languages for many years, particularly in constructed languages. As a student of computer sciences, I've come to think about languages in a much more logical way than before. How can you describe a language mathematically? Can you define a human language the way you can define a formal language? What is the most efficient a human language can get in terms of shortness and precision? Naturally, it came to me that a very efficient way of encoding information is the binary system that's used in digital communication. But then again, saying one and zero in a row would not exactly increase the efficiency of speech. Eventually, I came up with a quite efficient way to do it, and I'd like to present to you my results. So what are the features my bit language should have? It should be based solely on the binary system. This also excludes things like blank spaces and punctuation marks. The structure must lie within the language itself. Because it consists of ones and zeros, the language has no inherent phonetics, which means that a pronunciation is not part of the language itself, but rather a thing you'd wish to add to it in order to speak it with your vocal cords, tongue and so on. Moreover, as mentioned, the language should be very logical and unambiguous, with a clear structure and efficient in terms of briefness and concision. Challenges posed by these requirements include the inner structuring of a bit sequence, for example, separating words and sentences. Also, the language should be able to grow and gain new words. This means we cannot simply say that nouns should consist of exactly 10 bits, because then the total number of nouns would be limited to 2 to the power of 10 equals 1024, which is very little. We need a way to make the length of words flexible without creating ambiguity in their overall structure. Finally, there is the challenge of mapping phonetics onto the language to make it pronounceable. The phonetics also have to meet certain demands. You must be able to completely reconstruct the encoded bit sequence from them. Also, we cannot simply say that, for example, three zeros in a row become a T, and three ones in a row become a P, and so on, because something like 00011100 would result in something quite unutterable, at least for a native English speaker. The phonetic encoding must follow certain phonotactic rules. But let's start from the beginning. How can we give a structure to a sequence of bits? The fundamental unit of information in my bit language is the block. A block always has the length of a multiple of 8. This has the advantage that in digital communication 8 bits are grouped into one byte, so we can always represent the bit language as a sequence of bytes. A block always starts with one or more ones followed by a zero. The number of ones multiplied by 8 is the total length of the block. A block starting with 1, 0 has a total length of 8. A block starting with 1, 1, 0 has a total length of 16, and so on. While the leading ones and 1, 0 are fixed, the remaining bits contain arbitrary use bits that represent the semantics of the block. They contain the actual meaning. As you probably have noticed, a block can never start with a 0. While in theory we could say that a block starting with a 0 has a length of 8, a block starting with 1, 0 has a length of 16 and so on, in practice it is a useful property that a message always starts with a 1. In digital communication a 1 is usually represented as on and a 0 as off. As the default state is off, the receiver wouldn't even notice that the message already started if it started with a leading 0. Therefore we say that leading zeros are simply ignored, which will also have another useful application later on. Now we have solved the fundamental problem of structuring the bits, but how can we represent the block's relation to each other, like two nouns and a verb forming a sentence together with subject, verb and object? To accomplish this we define an n-ary block as a block whose first two use bits represent the number n of following blocks the n-ary block is in relationship with. For example, a block 10010000 would be a block that expects one following block. The leading 10 indicates the length of the block. The following two bits represent the number of arguments in binary, in this case 01, which equals 1. 
The last four bits, 0, 0, 0, 0 in this case, contain the block's semantics, which also define what kind of relationship holds between the block and its argument. We call an n array block satisfied if it is followed by n satisfied blocks, and a zero array or simply constant block is satisfied in itself. As you can see from this recursive definition, every correct sentence has constant blocks at bottom level, so to speak, and ends in a constant block in particular. Let's have a look at an example for a complete sentence, and with sentence I actually mean a satisfied n array block, whose semantics can be expressed as a sentence in English. When we highlight the syntax, we can clearly make out the structure within the sentence of bits. At top level, there is a block b2 that requires two arguments. The first argument is b hat 0, which is a satisfied block. The second argument of b2 is b1, which again requires an argument, which is given by b hat 0 prime. Together, b1 and b hat 0 prime form a satisfied unary block, b hat 1 which as a whole is b2's second argument and makes b2 a satisfied binary block, b hat 2. The use bits which carry the information are highlighted grey in this example. We'll call them lexemes. For now I chose random semantics for these lexemes in order to demonstrate how they form a sentence together. 1001 in a binary block stands for the verb to see, with the two arguments being the subject that sees the object. In a constant block it could stand for the noun I. In a unary block perhaps the act of watching, like in the sentence Joe does the dishes and Mary is just watching. A trinary block with this lexeme could have a more complex meaning, like to see someone someplace, or something like that, similar to verbs in Loschbahn. In order for the structure with satisfied nary blocks to work, the grammar has to be very strict. The arguments always have to be in the right order, as required by the lexeme. There is no declension or conjugation, but rather particles that carry grammatical information, like a plural marker or a negation marker. The semantics of such grammatical lexemes could be flexible. For example, the negation marker applied to a sentence could negate the whole sentence, while applied to a noun could invert the meaning or give it a negative association, like human with a negation particle becoming brute or barbarian. Now we have a basis for a fully developed language, but so far you can only write it down or spell it bit by bit, which is quite annoying. For it to become comfortably pronounceable by humans, you have to apply a kind of a phonetic function to it. How can we do this? A useful tool from computer sciences is the so-called Mealy machine. In the shown figure, every circle represents a state you can be in, and every arrow connecting two circles represents a transition from one state to another for a given input. You start in the leftmost state labeled with a mesh. Now you go through your bit sequence, bit by bit, reading a zero loops you back into the same state again. Reading a one takes you to the state labeled with a double mesh. From there on there are four different transitions. For example, if you read one one, you get your state t, the slash followed by a T coming off the 1 1 is the output of the Mealy machine. This way you go through your bit sequence and follow the transitions. This way you end up with a sequence of outputs, which is your orthography. For this example, I choose an orthography that has only four letters A, N, O, and T. The phonotactic rules say that NT is the only allowed consonant combination and two vowels cannot follow each other. Naturally, the resulting language is quite silly sounding and longish, but the corresponding Mealy machine is comparatively small. This is the output for a sample sentence. You have probably noticed that some states are represented by a double circle. These states are called halting states. These are states where the spoken sentence can end according to the phonotactics. For example, in the figure you can see that NG is not a halting state, because a sentence cannot end in a consonant cluster. If you end up in a non-halting state after you read your bit sequence, you can just read imaginary zeros until you reach the halting state. For this to work out, the Mealy machine has to have the property to end up in a halting state from every state by inputting only zeros. Otherwise you could end up in a loop and get an infinite sentence. As a resulting sentence is still quite hard to read, we can put in spaces and accents at will to signify stressed syllables. For this example I used an alternating trochaic and dactylic meter. Antan, 
tan tanto tato tato ta nata tanato. Sounds quite pronounceable. Of course, stress and any other articulation feature can be part of the phonetic function too. The more complex the phonetics, the shorter the speech can get. Unfortunately, the Mealy machine gets arbitrarily complex as well, depending on the number of phonemes, articulation features and complexity of the phonotactics. Lastly, let me talk about possible applications of bit language. As already mentioned, the binary representation is especially useful for digital communication. The transmission of a language that is directly based on bits would be faster than encoding the Latin alphabet and transferring an encoded English text, for example. Furthermore, because of its logical and unambiguous structure, bit language could be used for texts where ambiguity is unwanted, like laws and other legal texts. The most important factor, though, like for most constructed languages, is aesthetics. I think it's just a really nice feature that you can have a language that has potentially infinitely many sound representations. It would be a great language for, say, a novel with a hyper-intelligent race that speaks basically the same language but uses different phonetics, possibly based on regional differences or social class. What's left to do now? In order to make bit language a fully qualified language, there must be a vocabulary, i.e. a dictionary of lexemes for our possibilities. Moreover, the concept of the strict relational block structure has to be tested under real-life conditions, to see if it's possible to translate, for example, a book into bit language. Human language tends not to be completely logical. Context and connotations play a big role. Thank you a lot for watching. Please let me know what you think of my conlang concept. If you want to share your opinion, have any questions, suggestions or notice any errors, I'd be more than happy to read your comments down below and get into discussion with you.